I had a suggestion to talk a little bit about cable TV and cable TV modems. So I'm going to do a two-part series. I'm going to talk real basic about cable TV and then I'll do another one real basic about cable TV modems. If I don't bore everybody to tears, it is more interest, I can do a lot more detail on all of these subjects. I mean, here I drew tap run. This is the final end of the cable run. The tap would be in your backyard on a telephone pole. I could talk an hour about these taps and how we've put equalizers in them nowadays and uh, how they've, you know, I could just talk on and on how it's very little loss on the high ones and you get down to the low values and take a bigger and bigger bite. Lots of detail. Anyway, let me go back to the start. I started working on uh, intercom systems and uh, MATV and SMATV systems with private contractor. And uh, eventually I got stolen by a SMATV company. MATV means Master Antenna Television satellite master antenna television CATV which means community antenna television originally they kept the frequencies below like 280 some megahertz somewhere in that zone uh, up to the super band I guess that did already cover the mid band I was gonna say they wanted to skip the mid band originally they did just skip the aeronautic channels which are channels A, B, C um, I know we used to skip those channels in the early days before the whole leakage thing came out and that's another whole big subject go on for several videos about that if I wanted to anyway they kept pushing the top bandwidth of the cable systems higher and higher when I got into uh, cable TV out of SMA TV and got into cable TV after my company got sold out I went to one of the cable companies that bought up um, the assets of my company, a company that no longer exists called Continental Cable TV, a very fine company um, in many ways. And then I be ended up with Media One. Uh, another company doesn't exist anymore. Media One had a lot better technology than uh, Co Continental. Continental, though, was the friendly old days, you know. The job kept getting tougher every time someone took over. The job gets tougher. And the industry kept getting tougher and tougher. This is really a glory job being a line tech in the early days. You kind of did what you wanted. Um, we had some really... I had, we had a line tech that would just sit in the office half the day. You know, back when I was a service tech. Of course, they started taking all the slack out when I became a line tech. I never got the slack days. At any rate, let me go through a quick diagram well, I haven't gone all the way yet. Yeah, so when I started in the business, 400 megahertz equipment like this guy here. Real antique. This is probably a 30 year old antique. Except ours didn't even have return amps in them. We were a one way system. This module wasn't even installed in ours. I don't know where I came up with this old piece of junk. And then we had some gear that had gold labels instead of blue labels, and that stuff was 450 megahertz, and that was the fancier, better stuff we always tried to use. And then they came out with power doubling LEDs. Actually, the gold ones were power doubling, the 450 megahertz were the first ones that were power doubling. And nowadays they use something called feed forward technology, which is way beyond that. It's almost, I don't, I'm not going to get into that, and I'll go for an hour right there. Anyway. Our system got rebuilt. Eventually I was in a 750 megahertz system. We were building our passes up to 1 gigahertz standards. And we had a 50, a 5 to 50 megahertz return spectrum, which I'll start explaining. It's a two-way system. It needs a return spectrum. So channel 2 starts at, what, 54 megahertz, somewhere in there. And it's the lowest channel we use. So systems that are smart use that bottom spectrum return and they didn't intentionally give themselves such a small area this 5 to 50 and in fact I, the system I worked at last it was an older system it hadn't been upgraded to much of a point it was kind of advanced for its time so it never got upgraded only 550 megahertz and only 5 to 40 megahertz return 
And that's because the diplex filters in these amps weren't as tight as they are in modern amps. So from 50 megahertz going one way on a diplex to 54 megahertz going the other way on a diplex and not having any interference in between the two, you know, going opposite directions with high gain amplifiers, that has to be one heck of a diplex filter. These amps were economized a little bit by having a little bit looser diplex filter. You know, so they had that 40 to 54 megahertz area that they could do their cut off and boost and whatever. Anywho, most modern cable systems today are hybrid fiber coax, HFC, hybrid fiber coax, which means we're fiber for the big lengths, and then when we get into your neighborhood, you know, probably right on your block or maybe a block or two away, there'll be a fiber optic node. And they've made these smaller and smaller, these node areas, the idea is to keep, keep driving the size down. And they have thing like N plus 7, which would mean a node plus 7 actives after it, or N plus 4 would be 4 actives after it. They keep trying to build that down to a lower and lower number. In the old days, it was, you could have, you didn't have fiber optic nodes in the old days. You had super trunk, which was a nice big trunk line built to cover the distance and not to have a bunch of stuff splitting off of it. And then that trunk would feed, you know, stuff like this distribution systems. Nowadays we don't do that anymore where there's no more super trunk. There's fiber out to what what's called a node, optical node, and it goes from light there and into a regular old coax. And these usually have about four outputs for coax. And then you split from there out in the field, you know, as you go on. So a node can feed a whole lot. Like I started to say, originally they started having only a few nodes when they first came out. You'd split your city up to maybe three or four nodes, you know, and then we went to all the different areas. Um, in the old days we had areas, we had our cities divided up to areas, and uh, we started putting, well that all changed with the nodes. The areas shifted a little bit. Anyway, that's more detail than I want to get into. A lot of evolution going on, needless to say, um, to make the nodes smaller and smaller, and that's what's been going on over the last 20 years. And the real problem with most of these systems that were built this way, even the 750 megahertz system with a 5 to 50 megahertz return, is if we had divided, if we knew modems were going to be the big thing they are now and that DOCSIS was going to be the be all end all that it's becoming, then we would have given ourselves a much bigger return. And probably mid, there's something called a mid split where your return goes all the way to the mid band to split uh, like you know 175 megahertz or somewhere in there you know anywhere in there 100 megahertz anywhere in the mid band you could be split I don't know what frequency they use but give you a lot bigger return path as it is especially on a system that I just came out of which only had a 5 to 40 megahertz return band things are really congested in that return band in fact because there's a lot of noise and crud down below 15 megahertz or so you really don't use that very bottom end. You're really 15 to 40 you know, for a usable bandwidth in our system that we had. Or even 15 to 50 in a regular system. So, but I'll get more in return band and return noise and all the return issues when I talk about cable modems in part two. So let's go through my thing here. In the old days we had a head end. This is the office building of the cable. And originally they had a field full of uh, satellite dishes and antennas. And they'd, you know, get off of satellites, they'd get off of antennas and rebroadcast it into the cable. And that went on for a long time. More recently, most of the MSOs now, you won't see their, you'll see them taking down their dishes for the most part. The bigger ones anyway. They've got all their head ends connected by fiber now. No need for the dish farm, no need to send someone out to shovel off the dishes when the snow gets deep on them and everything else that we used to have to do for the dishes. And out of the head end we have three different signals. We've got a return signal, which I've done in blue. I was going to do it somehow my blue and red got switched, but I'm just going to stick with it. I did my return in blue. We have a return signal coming out of, uh, actually into the head end to be processed for the cable modems and the cable box information and all that good stuff. 
but we mostly have an out path and there's a broadband path and a narrow cast path. Since these nodes are all over the different neighborhoods, we can narrow cast to a specific neighborhood on a specific fiber. And the, the node for that area is going to have that one feed, that narrow cast feed plus the broadcast feed, plus it's going to have a return output. And that's going to go over the fiber. And there could be a patch panel or several things the fiber is going to go through. It's not necessarily one piece of glass. Ideally, it would be one piece of glass. And you get in the node and there's an optical receiver and transmitter for the return. Transmitter is a laser. This is a laser here too. And then optical transistor for receiver. This is all combined and inside the node after the optical parts it goes to a regular RF amp. The forward and return go through a diplex filter just like I show in this amp. This here is an amplifier laid out in more detail. It's not a full detail, but it's part of the detail. And that would be in this little thing here I drew as an amp here, as well as all these I drew out here. These would be more distribution amps. And then you'd finally, your last amp might be a smaller amp called a line extender, which is what this thing is. This is a little line extender from the good old days. And then finally feed the taps, and finally off of one of the taps might come your customer drop to your house. Inside the amp, and talking more about these diplex filters and how critical they are to the whole shebang are these very tight filters to separate the forward and return. Your forward normally has two hybrids in it with an equalizer in between. You also have equalization on the return path and padding on the return path in and out available for return and forward normally in most amps nowadays. Now these older amps had variable controls for the R RF and they don't do that anymore nowadays it's all plug-in pads mainly because unless you're dealing with an AGC level you just can't put that kind of frequency through a you know high frequency through a pad pot anymore and if you're not going to put high frequency to the pot you're going to put a DC reference uh, through and that's what why you still do see variable controls and automatic gain control because you're basically putting a DC voltage to that pot, not RF. But that's getting the detail. It's called a pin diode attenuator where you can turn signals on and off with pin diodes. That's another topic we can get into someday if anybody's fascinated by that. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover though here is the equalizers and stuff. And I put these little flashes in for padding points. And I put all these divides in to show you know how things divide a million times through all the amps and finally feed a row of taps. So the only thing I haven't talked about is slope and equalization, which is the main thing these amplifiers do. They amplify, but they also tilt the signal upwards. Meaning the amplifier may end up only boosting channel two a little bit, a few dB, where it may boost the highest channel 10 dB hotter than that. You know, if, you're, if your tilt was 10 dB, that would be a 10 dB tilt, your lowest channel to your highest channel being 10 dB different. The reason we make our high channels higher and hotter is because cable does just the opposite. Cable has more loss as frequency increases, the loss goes up. So the equalizer, which is a Zobel, I talked about Zobels in a previous video. Equalizer, it's not, is a, what makes a Zobel special basically is very little reflection. It's a more complex filter than a simple RC or even a Pi filter, but it's absorbed. It's supposed to have very little reflection either from either side of the filter. So it may have more loss than a simpler filter, but it's not going to reflect energy back. It's going to have a more constant impedance across the bandwidth, basically. So Slope, which is sometimes called tilt, and equalization. That's basically a cable has more loss at higher frequencies than it does at low frequencies. And any kind of water intrusion into cable dramatically makes that worse. It uh, shorts out the high end really badly, attenuates the high end real badly. If there's any kind of moisture creeping into the cable system. So 
and I'll get into that maybe in a future topic too. But the things, uh, you know, an open in the system does one thing, it knocks out your low end. Uh, short in the system or water system knocks out your high end. And basically, there's normal cable loss that gets higher at high end and equalization to take care of that. And you're hoping that someone didn't try to cover up a problem. You know, maybe the cable's dented and there's successive loss or there's moisture in some spot in the cable or some splices of it. And you've got excessive tilt. You know, a hack technician could camouflage it by maybe taking the pads out and uh, amping up the tilt and then uh, not really finding the real problem. That's the kind of battles you learn, you know, and the more experienced you get, the more you know not to fall for any kind of BS or BS yourself, basically, because it's kind of a, when you're working on this kind of system, it's big, you know, and the maps can give you a guideline, levels and stuff that you should expect at that point, but it's never exactly what is shown on the design. It's always different in the field. They're supposed to put in as built when things are built substantially different, but even when they're built exactly like the map, there's little differences, a little variation. A good cable system freshly built will actually do a little better than spec, but that's not common and that's not something that'll hold up. At any rate, I'll do a part two about cable modems and I can get into more detail on any particular subject in here. If anybody really desires me to, I don't want to bore you, bore you all to tears. And there's plenty of videos out there to uh, get in most of this detail, but I, I'll gladly uh, go further on any particular topic.